morning, and greetings in the precious name of Jesus this morning. It's just a small amount of us here this morning, but I had to think of it this morning, you know, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I will be with thee. And uh, I, I don't know about you this morning, but I believe that Jesus is here in our midst this morning and wants to worship and wants us to worship and praise him for what he is this morning. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change, neither does his word. John has messaged me earlier this morning when they were on their way up to Wisconsin and said that he feels kind of foolish to be driving to Wisconsin to a church this morning to preach. And he said his throat feels raw and feels like he's coming down with this flu bug as well. and So I thought this morning we'd have a word of prayer for John. He's probably getting ready to preach up there as well. So why don't we have a word of prayer for John right now at this moment. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come to you here this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your sharpness of your word and the power that you can give us through your spirit. And, Lord, we pray that you would be with Brother John this morning. That you would bless him, Lord. We pray that you would guide and direct the congregation there at Living Hope in Wisconsin. We pray that you would, your spirit would lead and direct there this morning. We pray that you would have your will and way in our lives as well here at sunrise. We pray that you would help us to see the pureness of your word and, Lord, that you are the true vine this morning. We thank you. We praise you in his worthy name, we pray. Amen. Okay. So this morning, um, talk a little bit on uh, message text will be out of John 15. And uh, it's on the being disciples and the re- recognizing the fact that Jesus is the true vine. So the root to true discipleship. I believe this morning each of us should have a relationship with Jesus that we can more fully grasp as every day of our life goes by, that we can recognize this relationship for a forever relationship, and that we can pursue this relationship in a more effective and meaningful way each and every day of our life. And how do we do that is by pursuing Jesus. Pursuing God for who he is. Pursuing Jesus for what he did on the cross of Calvary and was victorious and stood up from the grave, from death and the grave. I would like to encourage all this morning to become connected to that true vine. To stay connected to that vine and flourish by being connected to that vine. Turn to your Bibles in John 15 reading the first 13 verses, 14 verses. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. Men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as if I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that he a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Jesus is here talking to these 
his disciples. This is the night before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus was just finished eating the Passover with his disciples. He has told them that he's going to go back to his father. And quite a few of them did not understand what Jesus was trying to say. Jesus comforts them in John 14, verses 1 through 4. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that when I, where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go now, you know, and the way you know. You know, when you think about this vine and the branches, I don't know how many of you have grapes. Any of you have grapevines? Okay. Well, grapevines are something that they cling. Uh, you, you, they, they grow up a lattice or they grow up a trussle. And they, they grow out on something and they attach themselves to something. And off of this vine, this main vine, there's these branches that grow off of it. And in, in a grape arbor, in grapevines, we've, we've had grapes once. That In the one place we lived, we had some grapevines. And we were told that anything that shoots up, to cut them off. And those branches that go out and cling to something else, those are okay. But when they go up, you cut them off. And we'll get more into the molding and the shaping of our, of our life as in per pertaining to being branches off of that true vine this morning. But that true vine, it grows and it clings to something. And I think we've all witnessed or, or have experienced the fulfillment of Jesus coming into our life, and He wants to attach. He wants to attach, and we need to be attached to that vine in order for us to be, bear fruit and to bring forth life. You know... Life doesn't come, you know, we could take, and you could take, uh, for instance, uh, string beans. We, we, uh, we, we bury seeds in the garden. And, and these string bean vines grow up, right? And the deer come out and they, they chew off that vine. And there's nothing left but just that root in the ground. But, you know, after a while, that, that sprouts again and, and the vine doesn't do as good, but it does bear fruit. You know, sometimes things happen in our life that might hurt that vine. And it needs to be nurtured. And Jesus is there to nurture that vine. Jesus is the true vine. And, and we're what grows out of that vine. Is that vine something that we're connected to this morning? You know, you can take... A vine, you know how you're out and uh, I don't know how many of you have grown pumpkins in your life. But if you take a pumpkin vine, for instance, you know those big green leaves, they're, they really fold out. And uh, inside those vines, those branches that come off those vines, they're hollow. Okay? And you cut one of those branches off, it, in a matter of minutes, that leaf withers just withers away. Friends, that's how it is this morning when we're not connected to the true vine of Jesus Christ. We wither so fast and we have nowhere to grasp or to get a hold of because we're not connected to the vine. We need to be connected to the vine. So the root of discipleship, Jesus said, I am the true vine. The figure is one of a vineyard, someone who cares for the vineyard, someone who nurtures the vines. When we think of I am the true vine, my mind goes to the I am statements that Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life in John fourteen six. When we think of Jesus being the way, the truth and the life. You know, we all want to know the way. We all want to know the truth. And we all want life. 
Brothers and sisters, life comes from Jesus. There is no other from wherewith we can have salvation. I am the resurrection, he said. He said, I am the resurrection. He has resurrected. And so can we. I am the Lord and Master. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. These statements tell us who Jesus really is. He's a true Messiah. He's the one, the only, the true king, the God of gods, the king of kings, Lord of lords. And he is the root, the vine wherewith we must be connected to. In Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered Jesus when Jesus said, who do you see that I am? And Simon Peter said this, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Is that our testimony this morning? You are the son of the living God. We must know Jesus to be his disciple. In order for us to be connected, we must know that he is and will always be. John 7, 17 and 18 says, If any man will do his will... He shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God, whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Friends, if we go through life seeking what's good for us and only for us, and we're not looking out for the good of others, and we're just out there trying to make ends meet for us, We're seeking our own righteousness. You know, we might have the question that the disciples had. It says, Lord, to whom shall we go? When he told them that he's going. To whom shall we go? And I think Jesus instructed them here in in 15. He was trying to direct them what it's going to be like when he's not present in body. He was trying to give them direction, to give them comfort, to give them consolation, that he will be with them in spirit, but, but that they need to focus on that he's the true vine and they need to they need to live by the spirit of God. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. To know Him, Philippians 3.10 and 11 says, That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Knowing Jesus in a relationship, in a, in a way that is intimate. You know, being connected to that vine means intimacy. We need to be connected in a way that we are with those that we really love. We talked about in the Sunday school hour about uh, how that we can have this hope or how that we portray hope or Uh, what Jesus is to us or what does Jesus do through us. And friends, Jesus died once and for all. He's not going to die again. We can choose to follow Him or we can choose to turn away from Him. You know, the Father loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, us as parents here, we have children. We love our children. We want what's best for our children. We want to teach our children about the ways of God. 
We want to walk with our children in a way that we feel that Jesus walked with his disciples. The way that we want to do the things that we think that Jesus would do. In spite of that, our children may choose to walk away from God. Does that mean that you as a parent were a failure? If we would say yes to that, then what we would be saying is that Jesus was a failure as well because many have turned away. Because He is the true Father. There's going to be many that turn away. There will be some that follow. Jesus is the true vine. And just because there's branches that get cut off or branches that wither and are thrown into the fire does not make Jesus or God a failure. Neither does it make you a failure. But we must be connected to the vine. We are the branches. Branches grow out of the vine. In a relationship of a disciple, we need to be connected. Second Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So we need to grow. We need to grow in grace. We need to grow in love. We need to grow as children of God, as branches off of the vine. The young in the faith must grow. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that she may grow thereby. What, What is making us grow? What is making the young in the faith grow? Are we there for the young in the faith? Are we giving direction? What did Jesus really want? Are a lot of questions that we could ask ourselves this morning. What did Jesus want? Jesus wanted us to walk in His will. To be in the center of God's will. And you might ask yourself this morning, what is that? What is the center of God's will? Brothers and sisters... When we think about being in the center of God's will. I believe when we walk a a life that is pleasing to God. We walk a very humble life. We walk a life recognizing the fact that I could slip and fall. And I need my brothers and sisters to guide and direct me each and every step of the way. I don't know how many of you have listened to Billy Graham, but in one of Billy Graham's messages, he said this story of this of this uh, missionary over in Haiti. And this gang came in and they overtook the villages and they took the men out of that village to grow their marijuana or whatever they were raising. Their drugs that they were raising. They took the men to to grow this stuff. And they left the women and the children there. And amongst the women, there was this lady from the States that had uh, was a doctor. Her, Her name was Miss Williams. And she was there, she stayed there. And there was this this guy in in the Haiti area that lived just outside of Haiti there. Um, I don't know what place that was where he was living. But anyway, uh, it's kind of vague to me, the story. So I might not get it exactly straight the way Billy Graham had stated it. But he would fly supplies into these villages. He would f- fly supplies in. And through all of this, this Miss Williams' dad was living in the States. And he wanted his daughter to come back. Because he had heard that there's this animosity there with these gang leaders. And, and Haiti was falling apart at that time. This was in the 90s. And uh, so he asked a good friend of his that had uh, almost died with his boy in an airplane accident the year before. He said, please go and get my daughter. 
So he he just he's like, if she doesn't listen to you, she probably won't listen to me. But he ends up going and he flies into this airport to fuel up before he goes on over into Haiti. And he he runs into this guy that that uh, supplies these uh, supplies, these hospital supplies and doctors, doctor supplies and stuff. And the guy's like, hey, he said, I'm, I'm glad to see your airplane out here. Uh, I need to fly these supplies over there to where you're going. And uh, the guy's like, well, I ain't, I ain't taking it. I'm just going over and getting that doctor lady out of there and I'm leaving. And he's like, oh, no, you can't do that. They need these supplies. They need these supplies. The Lord has told me that they need these supplies. And, and this guy that's flying this plane is not a believer. And he's like, you mean to tell me that God told you that they need you apply? Who sent you the telegram? Who sent you a message? He said, God sent me the message. And they need these supplies. Well, he wasn't going to take them, but he, he finally decided he, he would take them. He said, well, why don't you use your helicopter? He said, the helicopter's broke. It don't work. Okay. So they loaded everything into this airplane and they fly into this remote grass landing, rough uh, shrubs growing up. Uh, he's like, I, I don't know if I can land this thing in there. This was like a 20 passenger uh, airplane. They land in there and they, they run in there and here these here gang leaders came out and they start shooting and into the air and the children run and everybody runs and hides in the brush. Well, all said and done, they seen this airplane and they were like, oh, they got an airplane now, these gang. Thought, Man, this, this airplane will work out very good for their endeavor. Well, so this guy that he flew in there was a believer. And he told this pilot, he said, you know, he said, uh, he said, we all need to get, we need to get these people all out of here. And the pilot said, well, I, I can't fit them all in my airplane. There's no way I'll be able to fit them all into this airplane. There's 28 plus us. He's like, well, we have to. We can't leave one behind. And so there he commenced to tell this pilot the story about the, the 90 and 9. And the sheep that was left out there. And he said, you know, if there's one left, what would you do? And, and the pilot said, well, if we can take everyone but one, we'll leave the one. We'll, we just won't worry about the one. At least we got that many. Well, it got bad. It got really bad. They had landmines set up. They had blown the one boy's mom. She died. It was something that you, we don't understand in America. Things that happen. And this, this guy... They, uh, they tore all the seats out of this airplane. They tore the seats out. They loaded everyone in there. When they were running to the airplane, the gangs had seen them leave. They were running. They took off on that airstrip. And they had everyone but the guy that had a walk with God. Everyone was on the airplane, but he stayed behind to distract the gangs. They took off down this airstrip, and he was too heavy. He couldn't take off. He ended up having to turn around and get a good headwind, and they didn't have headwind. And he said, Miss Williams said a prayer. And just like that, they got a headwind, and it was just so he could clear 
those branches. And they shot and they hit Miss Williams in her, her right side. And he, this pilot delivered these people to this place where he had fueled up. He dropped them off and then he thought of the 99. And the one that was still missing. Him and another guy got in that helicopter that did not work. And it flew perfectly fine. And they went back over there. And this pilot had this helicopter pilot drop him off. He jumped out and he ran to find this guy. He found him. He was still alive. And he started a big fire to distract the gangs. And the helicopter came in, landed, and they were just re getting ready to get in. This one that had been left behind was shot in the back. And this pilot ended up having to go back, carry this other guy into the helicopter. He died in his arms on the way back to base. Billy Graham asked this question, why does it take things like that for people to turn their life around? That made this pilot turn his life around and recognize where true peace, joy, and life truly come from. It comes from the life of Jesus. You know, us in America, we don't really recognize the fact that something like that could happen here. But we need to recognize the fact that unless we're attached to the vine, unless we're resolved, that if something like that would happen, what are we going to turn to? Are we in the center of God's will? This missionary that died in the pilot's arms, he said, what is more precious to be in the center of God's will is to be in the presence of God himself. Those were his last words. Branches have no life of themselves, neither do you without Jesus as your vine. Break a branch off of a vine and it will wither and die. And men will chop it up, throw it in the fire. We have no life of our own. We must rely upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 1, and 3 says, 1 to 3 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Brethren, we live in a day and age where it's so much easier to rely on what men tell us than to rely on the Spirit of God. And the reason that is, is because we can see, we can feel, we can touch. And those things, those tangible things in life, we have more confidence in than the Spirit of God itself. Brethren and sister, it's making us weak Christians. We need to rely on what Jesus did was enough.
Philippians 3, 9 says, And he found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Having the righteousness of God, believing in God, testifying of God, testifying of what God has done in your life. Brother and sister, we, can, we, feel, so, we feel so weak sometimes. But when, when we feel weak, that's when God can be strong. But when we, when we have this, when we come across this, we have everything figured out. When we have everything figured out, that's when God cannot do a work in our life. I was studying for this message yesterday. And I got a call from Leroy Kaufman. Some of you might know Leroy from Burksville. And uh, I had asked him to have meetings in the spring of 2024 here. And he was calling to confirm. And then he said, you know, John, he said, I'm studying for the message tomorrow. And he said, it's just not coming together. He said, does that ever happen to you? And I said, you know, it does. But I said, I figured after you're ordained for 20, 30 years, why that probably wouldn't happen anymore. And he said, it doesn't change. He said, when we're relying on God, God's timing is perfect. When we're relying on God, God comes through at his own time. Sometimes, sometimes we feel like God's, God's not answering till the 11th hour. But friends, that's when it's the most important, obviously. That's when God can use us, is when we're listening. You know, being branches off of that true vine is about listening to what God's Spirit is telling us. Christians can sin as to lose their salvation. Galatians 5, 4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. <laughs> Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That to me, brethren, is talking about the fact that we believe that Jesus died. But then we continue in sin that grace should abound. And it says that God forbid that we do something like that. Friends, that's when we crucify Jesus afresh. Is we don't recognize that what he did was once and for all. And when we sin, we must do that once for all. When we repent, when we sin, that it's not just something that we do every day and ask for forgiveness. It doesn't mean that we don't fall into sin. That we don't do things that we wish we wouldn't. But we need to ask God. We need to go to the vine and ask for forgiveness that we wouldn't. That we could be overcomers. What we as disciples must do to abide in the vine. In order for us to live, we must remain in the vine. Remaining means keeping Christ center and first in everything that we do or say in life. Abiding in Christ means letting Christ's words abide in us. Meditating upon the precepts and the words of God. We must let those words live within us. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. It says, From who will give it to you richly and abundantly? 1 John 2.24 says, Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. 
John 8, 31 and 32 says, Then said Jesus to these Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I think we would, if I would ask this morning, how many of you would want to be free? We would all say we want to be free. But in order to be free, we must abide in the word. You know, living a Christian life, you know, we probably all heard it's, it's a hard life. Friends, it's an easy life. When you think about what some people face, the Christian life should look to us as an easy life. It really should. Why is that? Because all we really have to do is abide in the vine. In the first six verses of John 15, it says to abide seven times. When we literally think about abiding in the vine, is that really that hard? Is that really that hard? It's really not that hard. We must abide. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. And because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know, patience isn't something that I would consider myself as having a virtue in. Uh, not saying that I shouldn't have. But I think if you would ask each, either one of my children, they would say, I probably don't have just too much patience. But, you know, when you think about patience and you think what that is, it says, and patience brings experience. We would all say, I, I would say, I, I, I don't mind having experience. I like seeing people. I like I, if I ask someone for advice, I, I want to ask advice off of someone that has experience. We all want to talk with someone that has an experience in uh, whatever it might be, a certain type of work, uh, whatever it is. That's, that's who we want to talk to. But in order to do, have experience, we must also have patience. And I would say that's something that I fail in and I, I want to overcome that. And hope maketh not to be ashamed. So when we hope about the hope that Chet talked about this morning, I really appreciated your devotional. You know, when we have that hope lying within us, we don't have to be ashamed. When that love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, we have no reason to be ashamed. Abide in the vine. In order for us to live, we must remain in the vine. Abiding in Christ means letting Christ's words abide in us. Colossians 1.23 says, If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Continuing in the faith, the faith that we have heard, the faith of Christ, the faith of knowing that what Jesus did was enough, knowing that there is salvation found in no other. Be fruit bearing. As disciples, we need to be, bear fruit. <clears throat> I don't know what we think when we think of fruit bearing. But, you know, I've never seen apple branches uh, complaining that they have to bring forth apples or uh, vines complaining or, or looking like they don't want to bear the fruit that they have. They mo look like they might be burdened down with fruit. Looks like they got a load to share. How is it with us? Do we have something to share? Do we have, as branches, have something to share with those out there? Because, brothers and sisters, you know, you might come in here to get filled. But you know, those people out that door are the ones that need to hear the gospel. And that might be at the gas station. That might be at the grocery store. That might be at the Walmart parking lot. That might be at Hobby Lobby. Wherever you find yourself. It might be at Lowe's at the lumber yard. 
Those are the people that need the truth. Those are the people that need to hear what Jesus did for you and I. Bearing fruit. It seems to me that many believe that fruit bearing is just for those super saints or those that have been uh, maybe called to minister or be preachers or something like that. Let's not forget, we're all ministers. Every one of us is a minister of the gospel if Jesus has done a work in your life. You know, when that life throws, flows through that vine out into those branches, I believe that fruit will happen just as it does on them apple trees. They don't have to think about having fruit or apples. It'll happen. And that is how it is when Jesus is in our life. Fruit will happen. The quality or the quantity of fruit isn't up to us. What's up to us is to abide in the vine. That's what's up to us. God will do the rest. God will send the increase if we water. If we plant, God will water and give the increase. As disciples, we bear fruit. What are these fruits called? I believe that we can call these fruits good works. I truly believe that. I think sometimes we want to shy away from the fact that uh, works. Do I think that these good works give us a better chance of salvation? No, because it's alone in Jesus. But when we've accepted Jesus, good works will happen. Notice Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Luke 8, 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. With patience. Sometimes it takes patience. When good works are in our life, others will see and glorify God. Matthew five sixteen says, let your light so shine before men. That, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The true vine provides everything that we need to share the gospel and the goodness of Jesus Christ as true disciples that are rooted and grounded in the faith. You can only be a disciple by putting your complete trust in the vine. Being trusting. Trust God for what you need and for what you have. Acts 4.12 says, salvation is in him and none other. There is no salvation found in anything else other than Jesus Christ and him alone. God wants to be there for each one of us. God wants to use each one of us. God has a special plan for each one of us. And I believe that when we truly seek and surrender our lives to what God has for us, we'll be amazed at the fruit that will follow. May we kneel for prayer. Heavenly righteous eternal Father, we do come to you here, Lord. We thank you for your, this day. We thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct us further today, Lord. We thank you for your word and how you speak to us through your word for you being the true vine. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to be branches that are there that are willing to serve you wherever called. And Lord, that you shape us and mold us according to your will in our lives. And Lord, that we can be in the center of your will. If we're not in your presence, that we can be in that center of your will. Lord, I pray that you would bless this day further. Be with those that are sick today. We pray that you would be with each one of them, Lord. That you would heal according to your will. And that you would have your will and way in each one of our lives. We thank you. We praise you. For the gift of spiritual brothers and sisters, Lord, for friends, for visitors, we pray that you would bless them as well.
We commit all of this to you in his name. Amen. Maybe I'll uh, turn it over to Daniel if you want to close. Yeah, well, I can say it was good to be here today, and 